Thank you. So, well, after this eloquent but gloomy depiction of a hellhole, I'm sure you all are hoping for an uplifting talk about the shining beacon of Switzerland, right? Uh, Gotta disappoint you a bit. <laughs> It'll be a bit more positive, uh, but as you know, we're all quite positive individually. It's only our Austrian realism that turns us into historians of the downfall, as Ludwig von Mises called it, or Hans would call it historians of decivilization. So I'll <laughs> try to do some uh, history uh, here. Uh, we have quite a history together now, almost 20 years, uh, almost every year. I was speaking here, and uh, I think it was more than 10 years ago, I spoke here about understanding Lebanon. And I started out with uh, Lebanon being considered the Switzerland of the Middle East. And of course, it was a story of a downfall. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> being considered a role model sometimes can lead to conceit, uh, and downfall can take a long time. So. Uh, if you look at Lebanon now, uh, it's much worse <laughs> than 10 years ago, but uh, it's always surprising how much worse things can get and how long it takes uh, these historical processes of decadence and downfalls to go down. Uh, fortunately, politics is not everything. So there are two counter forces that keep our spirits up a bit. Uh, and that's the catalectic and the technological counter force. Uh, so, of course, where there's almost universal regression and downfall and destruction from politics, uh, wealth generation by human interaction and technological progress, of course, have their fruits. Uh, and uh, it's enough to just have a little bit less political destruction than, than is generated every year anew to have a rising tide and still looks like things are getting better. Unfortunately, those two counterforces make it very hard to estimate the true amount of political destruction. So we tend to underestimate uh, how much wealth is destroyed, how high the opportunity cost uh, is of politics. Uh, and I think Switzerland is a prime example for that. Uh, uh, so it's actually a sad story, but still I have some explaining to do personally. When I told Hans uh, that I've moved back to Switzerland, his reaction uh, was a bit surprising. It was like as if I had told him that I moved to India. It's like, <laughs> he, he, he doubted my wits. He really doubted my wits. Uh, so uh, I, I'm not Swiss. I'll give you, I'm the Austrian Austrian. So I give you an Austrian Austrian understanding of Switzerland and then maybe explain a little bit why it's not entirely irrational and crazy <laughs> to live in Switzerland still uh, these days. So uh, it seems obvious. I mean, Switzerland is one of the wealthiest parts on the planet, wealthiest part uh, in Europe. Um, and uh, following a bit of Sean's advice, uh, even without knowing it, uh, they avoided wars and they haven't become an empire. So I think the two most important things, the two most important recommendations from history they have done that pretty well. Everyone knows that they avoided the two catastrophic world wars uh, that, uh, of course, uh, destroyed almost all the rest of Europe. And that alone should explain a little bit their uh, higher wealth. Um, when they avoided the two world wars, it was partly by luck and partly by resolve. Um, and that kind of resolve, of course, had a historical precedence. It was not political resolve. So it was very much against the politicians of the time that a farmer turned general, very much like Cincinnati uh, that Son uh, has talked about, Henri Guizan. Uh, basically, he uh, reunited uh, all his hundreds of important officers on the Ridley Meadow near Lucerne, and he had them take the oath to protect uh, homeland uh, and their Christian faith, uh, and uh, even be ready to give their lives uh, for that. And uh, of course, Henri Guizan, one of the most formidable opponents of the Nazis, would be considered a fascist uh, these days. Um, uh, fortunately, uh, uh, the Swiss uh, kept on, on the right side, so their identity is not entirely tainted uh, uh, by those associations, but still it's uh, some schizophrenia uh, that, uh, that has survived uh, in that country. Uh, 
what few people know is that uh, the Swiss have avoided much more wars and uh, one at least as catastrophic as the two world wars, that's the 30 years war. Uh, so that story starts much earlier. And uh, how did it happen? Um, uh, already in the 16th century, early 16th century, Machiavelli observed that the Swiss, uh, in particular Swiss mercenaries, are the best armed, the freest, and the wealthiest uh, that he's observing. Uh, and um, what made the Swiss mercenary, mercenaries the strongest military force in Europe? Uh, it was actually a kind of innovation military technology, which is quite similar to, to the Greek uh, history and even partly the Roman uh, history. And it's also behind this idea of democracy, uh, which is like one of the worst conceits uh, uh, these days. Uh, uh, what, what's behind it? Uh, they basically came up with a new form of warfare, dense uh, formation of pikesmen, uh, uh, which is a more equal kind of warfare uh, compared to the knights uh, waging war, because it's almost every farmer, of course, can have a pitchfork. And if you optimize the tactics uh, of this kind of formation, and, and uh, they figured out how to have the mobile, it was a kind of decentralized warfare uh, as well. Uh, and they really changed the landscape of war and were considered the most formidable fighting force. Of course, the, the Vatican guards uh, are still a remainder uh, of that time. But uh, as again with history and politics, usually we look at the wrong things. It was not the victory of the strong Swiss mercenaries that was the success story. It was a crushing defeat. It was a crushing defeat in 1515. They lost uh, to the more centralized French forces in northern Italy, Marignano, the Battle of Marignano. And since then, the Swiss realized, okay, we had the strongest fighting force. We still, uh, it was still a terrible defeat. Uh, and of course, this kind of more egalitarian war style, it's like father's not coming home. And it's father's deciding then again to go to war. And that's basically the basis of this kind of idea of democracy. The very same with the Greeks. So democracy originally is a process of plunder. It's the least bad, maybe the least bad process of plunder, but it's still basically about pirates dividing the spoils. And uh, if you have a kind of more egalitarian warfare, so every pirate has his sword, or if the Greeks it was the triremes, uh, every pirate more or less is, is uh, working along everyone else, uh, and the same with the phalanx uh, and the pikesmen. Uh, they, of course, divide the spoils equally. And uh, it's the representative of the households. So who are the people that the households would uh, be ready to have go to war and get bring spoils back? Usually it's the men. Uh, so uh, one of the signs that uh, Switzerland has uh, maintained some of the vestiges of democracy for longer than other places is that's the last Western country to uh, extend the franchise to women. It's not because they're sexist, uh, uh, it's uh, because the original idea of this pirate spoils process, of course, doesn't make much sense if you send uh, mothers uh, to war and have uh, uh, dividing the spoils. So it only works in a large pirate ship or a small mountain valley. That's really the only place where that kind of equal division of spoil can work. Uh, and that's, I think, everything positive about democracy. I mean, we're here at the Property and Freedom Societies. Uh, you, 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 you get uh, <laughs> uh, the, the idea. Uh, so, uh, of course, Switzerland is no democracy in this original meaning. Now you have, as in other, every Western pseudo-democracy, childless women deciding on warfare and men who wouldn't be able to support a family deciding on social security which is exactly the opposite of what the Greeks, uh, maybe the Romans, if we considered part of that, and uh, the original Swiss considered as democracy. Uh, so what is <laughs> Switzerland then? Um, uh, unfortunately, a role model. Uh, it was a role model quite early for the United States, and the United States as Switzerland still considered a beacon for the free and the brave. Uh, and of course, we've all watched uh, this history of a downfall. Still, the US is quite an attractive location and still Switzerland is quite a premium location, uh, quite an attractive uh, location as well. But uh, this role model where it served, it's now 
The biggest bullies are those inspired by the role model, that's the US and the EU. Um, and they are trying to track Switzerland along even further down their own direction. Uh, Switzerland in itself is like the EU. It's just better, uh, but not for the genius of the politicians. It's really just for geography, history, a bit of more diversity. Uh, it's the Swiss state is a federation and uh, it's very much like the EU. It has some very bad things like the EU has. Uh, uh, in some aspects, it's worse than the EU. It has even more uh, financial redistribution between cantons. So you would guess or one would maybe imagine that those cantons that have the highest tax uh, uh, rates should subsidize those with the lower tax rates. It's of course the opposite. Uh, the cantons with the lowest tax rates are the richest cantons and they got to send money uh, to the other cantons and subsidize the increasing parasitical class of politicians, NGO people, media, academics, as you have them everywhere else. Um, still, uh, so the question we have to uh, ask is how come if Switzerland for 500 years has maintained peace, not being offensive, avoiding wars, had this kind of economic flourishing, what are we comparing it to? We're not comparing it to India. We should compare it to southern Germany, Bavaria, western Austria, Liechtenstein, northern Italy. And then, of course, uh, Switzerland is wealthier than those places, but not by that much. And that's the big surprise. Why is Switzerland not 10 times as wealthy as those surrounding places? Uh, and one uh, riddle is that this area I described is the wealthiest area of Europe uh, and it's the Alpine region. And so I uh, wanted to figure out that riddle a, a bit. I wrote a book uh, once called Alpen Philosophy. It hasn't been translated to English, unfortunately. And I tried to figure out, okay, what's, what's so great about the Alpine region? And I came up with a few hypotheses. So I think three quarters uh, of what we like or may like about Switzerland and its appeal it's basically, it's an alpine country uh, that avoided some of the mistakes of its neighbors, uh, but is a great disappointment giving that potential uh, that it could have been a beacon uh, uh, of something. Uh, still, I mean, fair enough, it's, it's, it's a good enough place. Uh, it's still, uh, of course, a kind of disappointment. Um, so what, what's so unique about the alpine region? It's uh, how poor it should be. It should be uh, one of the poorest regions on the planet. Uh, Switzerland, of course, by natural resources, should be one of the poorest countries on the planet. Uh, and the same for the whole Alpine region. Uh, the kind of agriculture that works depends on a very thin layer of soil. And the maintenance of this thin layer of soil demands a particular kind of intergeneral cooperation. Uh, and this kind of intergeneral cooperation has developed to a particularly low time preference and high trust society, uh, which is quite unique for the Alpine region. Uh, it was a typical outlook, low time preference, of course, very long time horizon, intergenerational, intergenerational working together to maintain that little layer on which your sustenance depends. Uh, and of course, combined it with the typical independence of mountaineers, because geography alone, of course, uh, 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 creates its diversity, you have different dialects in every valley and, and people, modern means of transport and tunnel, tunnel building, it's like different, a different microcosm everywhere. Uh, still now in the Alps, you can combine that with the importance of the location, like in the middle of Europe and uh, between the Mediterranean and then the northern parts of Europe. So a lot of trade wanted to pass through and that led to an incredible importance of mountain passes and bridges, and around these passes and bridges, uh, formidable centers of wealth developed quite early. Add to that uh, the abundance of monetary metals around the Alps uh, and the very early mining starting there, and you see a constant flow of goods and money through certain narrow parts in that Alpine region uh, that explain, of course, a quite early divergence in wealth. Uh, so Bern already uh, the, the city of Bern in the 16th century was the most important European investor 
We were invested in all kinds of ventures. And earlier than that, in the Alpine region, you had an earlier industrialization. So hundreds of years before the steam-powered industrialization happened, we had a water-powered industrialization driven by entrepreneurs called the Hammer Lords, who were run water-driven factories that worked as mints and, and sawmills and so on. So it, it's quite early that you see the development now. The Swiss uh, cantons uh, realizing that uh, war is detrimental uh, and uh, just keeping still uh, this habit of, of uh, saving uh, for military confrontation, they amassed great treasuries. So Bern was very rich until everyone, everything was stolen by other politicians, the French, uh, of course. Uh, but uh, if the French hadn't stolen it, of course, eventually Swiss politicians would have uh, taken. And that's uh, all what happened with the, uh, a large part of the city wealth. Uh, what was great for Switzerland so far is that its identities, its religious and linguistic identities, are overlapping and in a way perpendicular. So that's a bit more resistance to homogenization. Uh, so it has been a bit more spread out. And I think the best way to understand Switzerland as a country uh, is to look at it as a kind of EU without Germany and France, without two superpowers uh, that are like relatively large and imposing. Uh, of course, the cantons are not all alike and you have some very small ones, but you never had that kind of overarching political pressure uh, from two uh, uh, forces acting on it. So it's still, it will still be bad, of course. The EU without Germany and France would still be a bad idea. Uh, not for the free flow of goods uh, uh, and so on, of course, but for the reason that such structures always are serving the main interest of a parasitical class. Excuse my words, I'll try to be very outspoken here. Uh, and you can see that class, and that explains basically why Switzerland is not 10 times richer. Uh, it's just 10 years better on average than Austria. If I, because I can compare that, <laughs> I, I'm Austrian, uh, which is not great. It's good enough if you have kids. It's great, I mean, the next 10 years, uh, are important. Uh, uh, on average, again, it's 10 years better. So cities like Zurich and Geneva uh, and Bern that attract the worst of that class uh, and uh, of course is nourished by a lot of fiat wealth in Switzerland are only five years better. Uh, so if you compare, you see the same kind of zombification, uh, excuse me again for being outspoken, uh, as you would have seen five years ago in Austria and Swiss cities of a comparable size. What's the zombification? It's like people uh, catching the mind virus that's going around, a kind of woke mind virus uh, in, in Western societies. It's a kind of people that for the spiritual vacuum they have, uh, being wealthy and, and not finding meaningful narratives are seeking all kinds of either personal fulfillment to get those narratives uh, and to get some status. So it's a kind of greed. I have everything, but I, I'd like to be appreciated as well. Um, and uh, some turn to a kind of death cult or death drive, which is not only not having kids anymore, but destroying themselves by taking drugs, drinking alcohol, all time of high time preference behavior, or destroying the society around them. That's all this kind of political activism, uh, which is really, I, I think, aptly described by kind of death drive. Uh, uh, so it's still better in these cities, but it's not that much better. And you see the, the very same things. And then interestingly, even though Switzerland uh, has the highest proportion of immigrants uh, and has been quite lucky for the relative uh, uh, advantages is offers to have a quite high quality uh, immigrants. They are imported, importing the kind of subsidized immigration we see in every other Western country as well. They import third worlders uh, as well. So what's behind that? Uh, uh, I think that's part of that greed for status. Uh, and it's quite similar to the reason the Swiss government has engaged in so much development aid. Uh, it's they are actually people who have everything and have a spiritual vacuum. They are greedy and they want to have status and they want to feel appreciated. So how do you feel appreciated? If your own underclass doesn't appreciate the handouts anymore, because I mean, giving a handout to a Swiss uh, is like, okay, 
they take it for granted. <laughs> it's like, oh, thanks for the 500 francs uh, here and the 500 francs there. You've got to go to the referral world, seek out distressed people, uh, have some great photo shooting op opportunities with some brown people that greatly appreciate your handouts and you feel appreciated again. Uh, so I think it's, it's a kind of greed. Uh, you have everything, you're privileged, but you still want to have more, you want to have status. You want to have kind of income uh, without being productive for other people. And uh, so, of course, they are doing that uh, as well. And then defining, the government is defining needy groups by ethnicity, as they do it everywhere. Crazy, very racist, very stupid idea. Uh, and then forcefully distributing those privileged immigrants that are subsidized onto the communities that now have to accept them uh, as their new neighbors, uh, very much counter to all the spirit uh, uh, that uh, Switzerland supposedly uh, founded on. Um, the financial redistribution, uh, of course, also has a lot of negative uh, impacts. I'm, I'm living in, in the richest uh, canton with the lowest tax, uh, which of course means they are the, the wealthiest, uh, they have the most money from taxes, uh, and they got to send everything they don't spend, <laughs> more or less, they have to send to burn. So now they are spending money. And of course, as politicians, uh, and politicians spending money is like, they think investing means you spend money on things. They have no clue that investing means saying no to all kinds of stupid ideas all day long. That's investing. <laughs> they think investing means saying yes to the first stupid idea that comes along. Uh, and of course, they do the very same thing. And it's painful to watch, but still, I think it's it's a privileged situation uh, where you're at. Uh, but uh, I think the biggest danger about Switzerland is be conceited and think it's like, oh, it's the beacon. The Swiss national state and democracy is like behind a Swiss miracle. Uh, that's why Swiss, Switzerland is so successful. Uh, and of course, it's all the opposite. <laughs> it's an immense amount of destruction uh, going on uh, in uh, Switzerland. Uh, uh, some uh, positive Right, so they have this kind of financial distribution. They very narrowly, so in the 90s, they started with tax harmonization as the EU, they have the very same direction, so very similar body, I'd say. So they have now minimum taxes and so on. It still leaves enough tax competition between the cantons, uh, not enough, I'd say, but uh, more than in most European <laughs> places and more than within the EU, even. Uh, uh, they narrowly avoided bailouts. So that's one positive distinction. In the 90s, there was a small community called Leukerbad. They wanted to become the uh, Europe's first spa town. So they invested heavily on using toxic debt and all kind of fraudulent schemes. Uh, and then, of course, when the whole venture failed, because it was politicians and not really uh, uh, was business people pushing for it, uh, the bank uh, wanted the canton to bail it out. Uh, and fortunately, the courts upheld uh, this principle that the cantons are still, or the communities are still responsible for their debt. But it was quite narrow. Uh, and, and so the greatest thing about Switzerland is how slow this process has been. Uh, the tendency, I, I think, is, is, is quite similar to other places, but uh, this lowness uh, has still made it uh, relatively uh, better. Uh, also, as uh, I said, the worst bullies are the US and the EU, because of course they see a kind of like potential role model, and, and the worst thing for the EU is that uh, everyone predicted, of course, the Switzerland outside of the EU would not be able to survive. It'll be impoverished uh, uh, and every kind of scare scenarios. Of course, the opposite happened. Uh, now, if you compare to the neighboring countries, great Germany, that thanks to the EU and the Euro, it should be the strongest uh, economic power on the planet, uh, uh, is of course losing rapidly. Lots of Germans are leaving to Switzerland, uh, uh, which unfortunately does not help uh, in Switzerland. They don't like the Germans too much. So I have a bit of an advantage as an Austrian. Uh, they, they <laughs> like us a bit more. So I've been very welcome. I have nothing bad to say about the Swiss. Uh, uh, so they're very, very nice kind of people. Um, but uh, unfortunately, of course, they don't really understand uh, the basis of the code because it's not so much political measures, it's avoiding uh, political mistakes and just being slower in doing the same political mistakes uh, and just being a smaller region by historical luck. Uh, so it's the most 
still looking like old Europe. It's, it's more like, a, like Liechtenstein. It's something that still has vestiges of the old Holy Roman Empire, kind of decentralized uh, Europe with all the you know, uh, different regions. Uh, so some uh, vestiges here uh, remaining uh, in uh, Switzerland. Uh, so the bullies uh, are getting worse. Uh, and uh, fortunately, there was one episode uh, that uh, was also in the 90s. It was when the Clinton administration helped uh, a Jewish billionaire who was getting rich in the liquor industry export Switzerland for $1.5 billion. Uh, uh, because he claimed that, of course, they were uh, taking advantage of Nazi gold and what have you. Um, uh, it, it was a ridiculous scheme of extortion. And it has led to some backlash uh, in Switzerland uh, because it was seen by some as that kind of uh, extortion. And if you look into the history of Switzerland during the Nazi time, uh, it, it should be obvious why gold was flowing through Switzerland. Uh, um, and uh, everyone knew uh, what was happening there. And, and uh, that's also part of the reason it survived that uh, within war you need some places where still some resources you can get out of the way. Uh, you have everyone look uh, on the side and still have some grayish, blackish markets uh, where some financial flows are possible. So without Switzerland would have been even worse, of course, uh, uh, in, in the war situation. They didn't let in that many Jews, that's right, but five times as much as the US. Um, so still, I think it would be crazy to ask the US to extort Switzerland for not having helped uh, Jews enough. Uh, so it was a criminal extortion scheme, I'd say. Uh, and I'm sorry for being outspoken again. And it has led to some counter-reaction uh, Swiss feeling extorted. And I see the same from the EU side. Uh, so I think that's behind a bit of an increase of Swiss identity, which is a fairly recent phenomenon. So now, if you look for Switzerland, you see a population being really proud uh, about their identity, the Swissness, uh, they call it. Uh, and uh, uh, in many other places, like Vienna, for example, the old Viennese dial dialect is dying out. You watch TV, you, uh, of course, have, have the pop cultural imprint, the dialects are disappearing. And the Viennese dialect was a quite unique one. It's the only German dialect that has extensive amounts of, of Hebrew and Czech words and its own grammar. So quite, quite an interesting mix. Uh, disappearing in Switzerland, the dialects are coming back, the Swiss German is coming back. So young people again are using it as the prime medium of communication. They are writing their messages uh, in Swiss German. So it's again, it's a written language suddenly. Uh, uh, the national sport of Schwingen, uh, which is a quite uh, interesting thing uh, to watch. I was surprised to even see small girls fight uh, in an arena. So it's a bit like the samurai. Uh, uh, I don't know how, how, how do you call it, you know, it, sumo, <laughs> thank you, the sumo fights, uh, uh, a bit, uh, you don't have to be fat, uh, um, it may help, <laughs> but uh, uh, so that also is a quite recent phenomenon, as a big success story uh, that you have that many people, almost everyone like attending fights between small boys, small girls, big guys, and of course the, the the big guys are then the celebrities uh, who win in that fight. And I find things a kind of identitarian counter-reaction to those extortions by the big powers. And I think the main advantage possibly in like having maybe the 10 years more time in watching everything else going down is you can watch it. And that may just be enough. And I think that really what saved Switzerland from EU accession, its elite was very much for EU accession, did everything in the power. The same propaganda I'd seen in Austria back in the years, how they moved like the population uh, from initial reluctance to joining some super body like that to then, okay, there's no alternative because otherwise, and we lose out. In Austria, they claimed like, uh, everyone would get a thousand uh, euros per year or a thousand shilling, what, what, what was it, uh, uh, if we have EU accession, just in the wealth premium uh, that will rain down on people. Um, Switzerland, they tried the same, but the process was too slow. So right now, arguing that joining the EU would be like joining a new powerhouse, uh, economic powerhouse, just doesn't make any sense anymore if you compare it. Switzerland in almost every uh, data point, you can get macroeconomic data point is superior uh, uh, to any other US states. Not because Switzerland is so great, <laughs> it's just because it has a bit slower and less destruction uh, than we've seen uh, in other countries. Uh, so there is a slight chance. I'm not no utopian, 
there's a slight chance that I, I, I still think after 10 years, maybe I'll have to move again, <laughs> at least, <laughs> or the most. But there's a slight chance, uh, I'm, just, I'm a bit worried that my family likes it too much. It's really, a, it's a nice place. <laughs> and it's about 10 to 15% price corrected, higher quality of life, I'd say, than Austria. Uh, it's, it's not huge, uh, so Austria still is a nice place uh, if you don't have to work for uh, the tax authorities all, all, all year long. Uh, and there are ways uh, to do that. Uh, but uh, there is a chance with everything falling down that, of course, the first necessity would be understanding that the Swiss state is very un-Swiss uh, and very much not aligned with the Swiss principle that what they mistake for democracy, actually, it's mainly the vestiges of a high trust culture. Uh, it's like, uh, and of course, with all the risks of a high trust culture, so high trust cultures tend to be more productive, more cooperative, uh, but uh, they also have the risk that they people trust institutions too much and they trust bodies too much and they trust too much that everything is doing well because of the institutions, why most of it is a kind of capital heritage, an invisible capital, and I think Chayan mentioned that uh, a bit, the, the, the habits, the mentalities, the things that have uh, grown over generations and, and which is really hard uh, to understand and in particular if you're not following the lens of Austrian realism and you believe the fancy narratives and ideas and basically the German idealism uh, um, of like painting institutions and governments with great governments and, and ideas like that, uh, uh, then you can really be led astray uh, and, and that they'll be sorry. So the best scenario, I think, is Swiss learning from the downfall of other places, other Germans, Austrians coming, finding refuge in Switzerland. The worst danger is that Switzerland turns against migrants of this kind because they have so many negative migrants as well, subsidized uh, by politics. And of course, they have a lot of appreciation in real estate. It's really expensive. Uh, uh, if you move there, that's due, of course, to the financial system. It's not due to the immigrants. Uh, it would be, I think, mis misleading to blame that. And again, the Austrian school helps uh, understanding uh, these distortions uh, as well. Uh, so I think there is some hope that they may wake up and become a better kind of role model. And a better kind of role model would be Bavaria, parts of Bavaria, parts of Austria, reinventing themselves as cantons in a really subsidiary, uh, decentralized, new rebuilding of Europe as it was meant to be, very much closer along the lines of the thousand Liechtensteins uh, that uh, Hans so ably uh, presents every year. But we are realists, so the hope is very slim, and uh, let's not darken our mood uh, by this outlook. I think we still can have a good life. Uh, Switzerland is a premium location, but just don't let yourself be led astray by political ideas. Thank you for your patience.